Good afternoon, everybody. We are very pleased to have today with us Kitty Nitrai. She's the head of unit uh, for decarbonization and sustainability of energy sources at the European Commission's DG Energy. Many thanks for being with us, Kitty. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> we are going to have a very interesting conversation about one of probably the biggest novelties that uh, we are seeing these days in regulatory terms, regulatory and policy terms. The hydrogen and the carbonized gas markets package has been approved right today by the Parliament and we'll see the light very soon. So it's the first time that the terms like uh, renewable hydrogen are really entering into regulation for Europe. It's a, an absolute first time. So what is actually um, going to change? What are we going to see changing? And uh, uh, what do you think are the main novelties of this package? So, I mean, we're very excited that uh, now what we have been working on for the past actually four years is, uh, is happening. It's in the light of the day. And what I find is very innovative in this package is, first of all, all the hydrogen market rules. So hydrogen is a new energy carrier that is, is going to be very important to achieve climate neutrality and for decarbonization. And we were trying to put in place a framework that that is comprehensive to facilitate hydrogen entering the market and to fulfill its purpose of decarbonizing those sectors where, which are hard to electrify and which are still need to be decarbonized in order to achieve climate neutrality. So with this package, we managed to complete this framework by adding the rules for hydrogen markets for the future. So how hydrogen networks need to be operated, how hydrogen can be traded so that uh, it can fulfill its purpose in decarbonization. So that I would consider the most innovative part in the package and definitely very necessary for hydrogen market to develop. But then, of course, we have other parts in the package because as we know that for full decarbonization, we need molecules also in the future and we will need also methane based molecules. We also ad ad updated the market rules in order to have uh, to facilitate renewable methane based molecules such as biomethane to enter the gas grids and to replace fossil gas in the longer term. Um, we also updated the consumer rules, consumer protection rules, mm -hmm. in order to give the same level of protection to gas consumers as we are already giving to electricity consumers. And then, of course, between the time when we proposed the package and be between the time when it started negotiations, uh, the world Many has things changed. changed. <laughs> yes, exactly, indeed. because we had this unjustified aggression of Russian, Russia on Ukraine. And this has changed our security of supply situation. So we also integrated in this longer term framework uh, a strengthening of the security of supply and especially the solidarity provisions and also the new feature of demand aggregation that has been tested under the emergency regulations. We included it in an adjusted form for the longer term framework. And as regards hydrogen, we included a pilot mechanism that should facilitate the scaling up of the hydrogen market. Wow, it sounds really <laughs> comprehensive and it's somehow a package which is built on solid grounds, you know, like uh, uh, coming from the past because at the end of the day, the gas directive, the gas regulation are the ones on which the, the whole uh, system based on natural gas um, was. Um, so it's basically an updating these rules as to look towards the future and make sure that uh, uh, a different scenario can actually be implemented. So congratulations for the achievement of really today. So we are really on time with this interview. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, uh, what can regulation do to support the integration of these uh, renewable and low carbon gases into the system? We know that infrastructure is and will be fundamental. Um, how do you see the role of regulators and regulation in general in this? Well, of course, very important. So we, we know that, um, that a stable regulatory framework is very important for investments to happen. So market players need to know what are the rules of the game in order to reliably be able to take investment decisions. I would still distinguish the hydrogen part uh, of the package from the methane based part uh, on the package because the rules are slightly different. So when it comes to hydrogen in particular, we are dealing with an emerging market. We are dealing with a nascent market where today there is hardly any renewable hydrogen uh, being produced, let alone being traded. 
So this is a market that will develop over time, that needs to develop over time in order to drive decarbonization in industry, in certain areas of transport. So until that happens, we wanted to leave flexibility for various regulatory models to, to emerge, but we also wanted to give certainty and stability about the longer term. We did not want to have to adjust ex post the rules of the game, creating thus, creating thus potential uncertainties in the regulatory framework. So we leave more leeway and flexibility until 2033, and then as of 2033, the full regulatory regime kicks in. So this, I think, was a very important feature of the package to really uh, reflect the nascent nature of the hydrogen market. Yeah, for some flexibility, indeed, which, is, uh, which was, I think, one of the, um, a, a very effective response to the big dilemma that we, we've been discussing already for a couple of years, how to um, put forward you know, the, the right basis for a market to develop without coming up with too stringent regulation, which is uh, uh, something that lots of regulators have been struggling about. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I have one final question regarding the package. Um, you um, already mentioned that the proposal of the Commission for this package dates back to 2021, spring, if I remember correctly, or summer? December. December, <laughs> okay, yes. thank you very much. So uh, at that time, the uh, big crisis had literally just started um, and more features needed to be taken into account and like the uh, whole agenda had a switch, uh, a temporary switch in priority, security of supply suddenly um, became the priority number one for those very critical months, obviously. Um, so now the emergency, is, we can say, is uh, almost over, or anyway, we are much better off compared to those times. Um, uh, how do you think this package can contribute to security of supply um, and the, actually what will be or could be the new challenges for security of supply for Europe? Let's start maybe by, by the emergency measures that have been tabled and agreed in order to deal with the acute phases of the crisis. Um, those we, we, we used to to learn the lessons from them. So demand aggregation and joint purchasing was one of these emergency measures that we had the occasion to test during the, the acute phases of the crisis and we saw that it could work. So what we wanted to do is to leave open the possibility to use these mechanisms, not exactly in the same form, because of course the crisis is one thing, the longer term framework is another one. So we incorporated those in a slightly adapted manner for more stable conditions and included them in, in, the, in the regulation. And the same for solidarity measures. So we've learned a lot about solidarity and the solidarity agreements. And we also seen how how necessary they are. So we included, we, we strengthened the solidarity provisions through this package mm -hmm. also for the longer term. But at the same time, we are also starting a review of the, of the security of supply regulation mm -hmm. in order to have a thorough review and to potentially, if necessary, table new proposals to strengthen further that framework in view of hopefully not, but a possible future crisis. Okay, okay very interesting. Indeed, the package uh, also includes this uh, specific security of supply provisions. Uh, good, so it also incorporates some lessons learned, as you yes. said, from the, from the crisis. Okay, um, so Kitty, it's really great to have you here. And uh, thanks for accepting to share with us also a little bit of your personal history and career um, for our Lights and Women initiative. Um, so, the gas sector, as we know, has been traditionally a male-dominated one, as we know very well. So, um, I first would like to ask for some personal uh, reflections of yours on how uh, it was for you to develop a career in this specific sector and if you encounter some specific difficulties and how you overcame them. If you have any good anecdote, we are here to listen to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, maybe my situation is slightly atypical compared to other women because when I was at high school, grammar school, I actually decided to go for mathematics and sciences. Mm. So um, at that time I went into career advice because I didn't really know what to do with my future and I came out of that career advice 
convinced that I, I need to do sciences. What I didn't realize back then, but we, what became very clear in the beginning of the year that we were three women in the class, so three girls, for like 20 boys. So the gender balance in my class of uh, mathematics, applied mathematics and sciences, was not exactly um, very balanced. So, but in a way that has uh, forged me to, to live and to thrive even in a male-dominated environment. So it, it was a very strong life lesson, which means that I wasn't exactly scared to go for the energy sector based on uh, gender balance grounds. Um, but I also need to say that when I then started my career, I never really felt any negative uh, or difficulties, or difficulties mm -hmm. from negative impacts or difficulties based on my gender because I felt that, especially in the beginning of my career, um, I felt treated exactly the same way like, like any other colleague would be. However, when the, when, once I started gaining experience, and once I started becoming maybe more eligible to promotions, mm -hmm. it's, I think that's where there was the first time in my life seeing that maybe women are not always treated exactly the same way as men are. And I'm going to give the concrete example or anecdote of my first director when I was in the European Commission. Uh, he was an excellent uh, person, yet when we would be sitting around in meetings or, or, or chatting, then he would turn to my male colleagues and, and would say things like, the day when you will become head of unit, the day when you will become director, this and this and that. And but never looking he at never you. said it to <laughs> me or to any other of the female colleagues. And this is when I understood the concept of gender bias. I've never faced it before, never seen it before, but that's when it struck me for the first time. So before I was never really in favor of female quotas because I've always felt I, I you, you know, would do it my, naturally. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was based on merits. I felt I was treated the same way based on my merits. But then the closer you get to the possible promotions, that's where you realize that there was a gender bias. And I'm speaking about was because I think, I mean, when I started my career, that's already now 70 years ago in the commission and I've worked before. So a lot of things have changed ever since. So I must say that right now... For the better. Exactly, for mm -hmm. the better. So right now in the European Commission, I do not feel in any way negatively discriminated based on my gender. I feel that I'm, treated, I'm being treated based on my mer uh, merits. And of course, we meanwhile have not only a very strong female leadership in DG Energy, but also a very, a, or a rather well-balanced, uh, gender-balanced uh, management uh, team as such. So I'm happy to say that at least within the Commission and within DG Energy, the things are going very well. But I am actually very much aware that this is not the case everywhere uh, and that a lot of work needs to be done. Um, so I'm encouraging every colleague who is working in the Equality Network uh, in order to, to really help, um, help to, to bring this change about also in the energy sector at a broader level. Do you level. think that uh, this change and this improvement actually in gender balance um, is helping the sector, the gas sector in particular, moving forward? And if so, why? How? <laughs> I'm convinced that it does. I mean, I'm convinced that in general, gender balance helps every sector. It's because uh, women are a very important part of society and um, you need just a lot of different ideas, no matter where it comes from, to, to come up with even better things. So I think that gender balance helps every sector in any way. Now, especially in the gas sector, as you said, it's still very male dominated. I do remember my first gas conference. We were like <laughs> hardly like one or two women in, in the room. Um, this is changing luckily as well, but it's still, I mean, women are still very strongly underrepresented. So just by merely increasing the share of women around the table in the discussions, it will bring in, it will harness all the wonderful creative ideas that we, women can, can bring to the table, but also the often longer term focus uh, on sustainability that women can bring to the table. Diversity can only improve the dialogue, no? Exactly. Uh, with different perspectives, any type of diversity we think exactly. about. Exactly. Wonderful. So we close with um, 
a final uh, uh, wish from your side, if there's any particular message or encouragement you want to give to uh, women who um, are interested in working in, in our sector, but maybe they feel a bit um, um, afraid uh, or, you know, like, what, what suggestion would you, would you give to them? What I tell my female colleagues very often is dare. Just don't put limits to yourself. We women, we often have this tendency to, to doubt about ourselves, to question whether we are good enough or, or, or to question whether it's appropriate to ask for something. I observe that men do not very often have that and me being forged also in a male-dominated environment, I didn't have that. So, but I see it in other, other women and, and I don't really understand it because I never had it. But this would be my advice to really just, you need to defend your own interests. You need to dare asking for the things that you want. You need to sp dare speak in your mind and then it will, be, it will be clearer of what we need as well because very often men may just not understand it. So That's we very need, true. To, That's we very need true. to state out right what we want to do and, uh, and then it will bring in uh, a whole lot of change, I think, also in everybody's mindset and hopefully bring about this transformational change. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kitty. Really inspiring. Thanks a lot.